everybody. We're going to be continuing our short series on the seven sacraments. And so since we dealt last week with the sacrament of baptism, which is the opening entrance sacrament, whereby we are washed in the waters of baptism and the Holy Spirit descends upon us and we become an adopted son or daughter of the living God and original sin is washed away. Well, the second sacrament of initiation is that of the Holy Eucharist. Many of our children are preparing to receive the Eucharist for the first time. You can imagine how disappointed uh, many of them are that it has been so much delayed. Normally it would take place in April or May. I believe we're going to be moving this to probably October, perhaps if necessary, even November. We'll have to see how things go. Now, the Eucharist, the second of the three sacraments of initiation. Now, let's, since the Eucharist is at the center of our faith lives, this is, this is, the, this is the sacrament and the sacrifice that is, the, is a sacred meal which feeds us and is a, it is an offering to the Lord of the most, what is most pleasing to the Father, and that is His only Son. Always keep that in mind. If there's ever a tendency to turn this, this Eucharist into only a memorial meal, then we're getting off the track of our long history of, as Christians, this always is and always will be a sacrifice, the holy offering up to the Lord. This is, as I had said in a previous talk, the reason why we can have Mass without anybody here present. You can have a so-called private Mass, uh, which really isn't necessarily private because of the presence of the communion of saints and the angels. But uh, we, could, we could have that, and that is, that is pleasing to God and valid and efficacious, right? It brings about what it, what it um, signals. And that is, it brings about a, um, an extension of the Lord's Eucharist, of his sacrifice on the cross through time and space. And I had also said that if ever it's the case that all masses were to stop, private and uh, public and private, you could suspect that the end is near because this is what has been extending the Lord's sacrifice. That's all very Catholic theology, of course. It's not uh, something that the Protestants uh, took on when, uh, during the Reformation. The other thing that the, that the Protestants questioned and challenged was the real presence of the Eucharist or the Blessed Sacrament. Somehow, even though it is, it is clearly stated in the scriptures and uh, in each of the Gospels, well, certainly uh, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and of course Jesus in John's Gospel, it, during the Eucharistic discourses, speaks very clearly and plainly that this is indeed not merely a symbol. It's not a symbol. It is, a, it is his own body and blood. This is very significant because it, first of all, means that the body of believers uh, in communion with the church, so in good standing with the church, okay, believing what she believes and striving to live according to, to uh, the teachings of the church, being in a state of grace, and uh, being baptized, of course, these are all necessary prerequisites to receiving the Eucharist. In the Roman Catholic Church and the Ukrainian Catholic Church, and certainly the Orthodox Church, there is no such thing as intercommunion. Intercommunion would be like some of the, some of the uh, denominations. They call this Eucharistic hospitality. And so they'll say, they'll stand at the front and say, well, if you have been receiving in your church, you can certainly come forward and receive in ours. Well, that's a nice gesture. And it, and it can work in those contexts because they believe they're not presenting the, the body and blood of the Lord. They're presenting rather a, um, a symbol Okay, under the form of uh, bread and wine, or possibly bread and grape juice. Okay, that's not the case with us. And further, in order to confect the Eucharist, we need to have a, a validly ordained priest or bishop who doesn't never loses the priesthood, and the Pope is a priest as well. 
he needs to be he needs to be validly ordained and he needs to have in mind the intention of consecrating the Eucharist, okay? It, it, here's something interesting for everybody. The priest can actually be even, he doesn't have to even be in a state of grace. If he's not, well, his own soul may be in the balance, but it does not affect the sacrament in any way, okay, the validity of it. So you could discover uh, th through masses that the priest could have been doing anything from A to Z of an immoral nature, perhaps even of a very repugnant nature, and it, may, it will leave the faithful with their heads spinning, and uh, be, maybe many will be disgusted, but let them know that the Eucharist they were receiving all that time was indeed valid. It really it was the Lord's body and blood. We call this um, Ecclesia, ecclesia um, Suplens, the church supplies, so uh, it doesn't rely upon the holiness of the priest. Actually, thank, thank heaven for that. <laughs> okay, really. Now, here's what, I'm going to just, uh, just take a couple of moments and show you some of the basic components that we'd be using during the Mass. Now, this piece of cloth, okay, it's white cloth, it's called a corporal. This is the base cloth where we would be putting this over the altar cloth and this will be where all of the sacred species will, will uh, be sitting and present. You, so you'll notice that it's right in the center of the altar and when the priest is setting up the altar and when we, are, when we consecrate and so forth, you're, you, you're, you're likely at some point to see the chalice over here to have the, the wine and water placed in it. But it's not left there or over here off of the corporal. No, there will always be on the corporal for the consecration and as a sign of reverence for the sacred species. Next, you will have uh, precious and semi-precious metals. Okay, there was, a t uh, there was a trend or a time when people were using crystal goblets or clay and this kind of a thing. Any manner of things, I guess when you're around as long as we are, that you're going to get all kinds of interesting things. Well, no, it's supposed to be these fine metals because uh, it's uh, because of what it will contain. So obviously, the finest and best for our Lord. Now, of course, what comes to my mind is that you'll always get those who um, they're okay. They're interested, as we should be, in social justice. They seem to want to take things down and uh, remove uh, the, the majestic elements of the church or not invest in them because it all has to go to the poor. That's a nice sentiment. Unfortunately, I notice, I have noticed over the years, those who have these sentiments often enough aren't quite as generous with their own money as they are with other people's money in terms of helping others. So that's just an aside that you may have noticed as well. Um, they become social justice warriors. No, the poor you will have with you always. Uh, we must work diligently because nobody wants to have that kind of suffering. Just imagine, most of us here, certainly in this parish usually, or um, in, this, in this land, many of us don't know exactly what a really impoverished life is like. And of course, the real problem with it is not that um, uh, the person has less chance of gaining salvation eventually, not just because it's unfair and unpleasant, but actually because the person's dignity as a human being is often in the balance. You know, just imagine trying to live without the basics of life. Well, that, um, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't allow that to happen if we could prevent it, certainly in our own families, right? So. So for those who say, you know, no, let the church run down and everything else, let's, let's, let's um, devote everything to the, to the poor and the social justice, well, then um, what about the glory of God as well? And so uh, God, has, uh, God has a claim, I believe, on uh, these, these fine things, the, the fine vessels, not because God needs anything, but because even for the people celebrating, um, Many people don't have a gold goblet at home, for example, a made plated in 18, 24 karat gold. But they're also not, they're also not uh, placing the Lord's body and his blood there. They don't have that in their house. Okay, so just, uh, just wanted to make that point. Now, corporal, so we've got the sacred, uh, the, sorry, the unleavened bread, 
after, of course, the, the Passover meal, the elements that Jesus took at the time of the Passover meal. So one of them was the unleavened bread. We always use that. And then, of course, the grape wine. Now, we simply uh, pour a little bit of this. You'll notice it's white. It could be red. Many, many choose to use white because it, it, it certainly is valid and it does, it is easier actually on the purificators to try and get and keep them clean, this kind of a thing. And uh, there's no point in using a lot of extra surfactants in the washing machine and so on if you don't have to, okay? That's, so that's why that's the case. Um, now, a little bit of water. Well, the water, the little drop of water represents our humanity. In an ocean of the Lord's divinity, our humanity is, is combined, and, the, and that humanity is very much um, co-mingled and uh, absorbed, really, in, in God's divinity. We, remember, God became man so that man could become God. And so we place ourselves in his hands, and what does he return to us? Here we are, we're meek, we're weak, we are mortals, we are sinners, and yet our Lord accepts us as we are and actually gives to us himself. He wants to ultimately divinize his people, okay? So we've got, uh, you've got your wine, you've got your... Now, some people have a gluten allergy and there might be a growing number of people. We call it celiac disease. We do have, in mo most of our parishes, a low gluten, not gluten-free, because it has to be made of wheat. And anything that's made of wheat will have at least some small amount of gluten. So this is from the Sisters of the Precious Blood, the ones who supply us with the other hosts. And it's got 0.001% gluten. So very, very little. Some people are so sensitive, however, we would have to cut this in half or even use a smaller particle or have them simply receive from the chalice the precious blood. Now, um, a couple of the other elements here. I have here a pix. This here, a pix, it, it simply means treasure, okay? And what it is, is it, it's a, a little vessel that will contain the Blessed Sacrament. So um, perhaps you have somebody at home, a shut-in, and they, re they would love to receive the Blessed Sacrament. So you make arrangements with the priest, he'd give you just a little bit of training. Uh, this has always been my policy, that um, if a person calls and there's nobody in their family or with whom they're living who attends Mass or who has a regard for, for the Eucharist, uh, then I or another minister of, of, of Holy Communion would go and distribute this for them. However, if they do have a family member who is able and willing, then I ask them, because then it takes a strain off of our ministers of Holy Communion and, uh, and the clergy, and if they can be trusted with this, then that, that's wonderful. Okay, so the, this is the pics, okay? So, and um, usually it's, there's a couple of prayers, maybe a scripture passage, and then they receive. Now, you're maybe wondering what this is. Some people, I'm surprised still at the number of people who do not know about adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. So this is called a monstrance. It, you can think of the word demonstrate, or in French, montre, to show. So the Blessed Sacrament is placed, the large host that was consecrated is put in a luna, and then we place this into the monstrance, okay? For the purpose of adoring the Lord. This has been done since, um, I think it's about, probably about 11th, 12th century, a number of centuries for sure, the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. I believe that maybe a little bit later than that. But it is a, um, something that the Lord has revealed privately, okay, that he loves. And the great thing about, you know how some people say, oh, the homily's too long, and there's this, I don't like the music very much, and there's all kinds of, or I'm so tired of hearing noise. Well, the thing about adoration, there are prayers. There are prayers, actually, that have been written for it, little booklets and from, from, you know, different devotionals and so on. But actually, with the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, you don't have to say, actually, you don't have to do anything. Just sit or kneel there. Just be there with the Lord. 
uh, really like uh, two people who are madly in love with one another, um, looking deeply into one another's eyes. This is, and there's the Lord looking at you, not with, never with condemnation. And even if a person is as far away as they can be in terms of the state of grace, maybe they're not fully Catholic yet, maybe there's, their life is a mess, this Lord will never reject them. And they're certainly most welcome to come forward and spend some time. And I can assure you, this will be a transformative um, devotion and exercise. So this is the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. It can be combined with benediction, in which case some incense is used, a, a couple of hymns, some prayers, and then we will bless the faithful with the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, okay? So a very a beautiful, a beautiful devotion, the uh, adoration. And we had been doing that Wednesday and Friday morning for an hour for a number of months now. And of course we had stopped. And when I come in, frankly, I, um, oh, I just had a couple of priests in actually, just a couple and they were distance and so forth, but we did have adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. But when I come in in the mornings, I normally simply adore the Lord and, and pray to him in the closed tabernacle here. And it's also silent in here, okay, so it's marvelous. Now, okay, first, we're, what we do is, uh, we, um, as you know, we've begun with the sign of the cross. We've had a penitential rite because we want to, um, we want to sort of uh, acknowledge the elephant in the room and to take it out. So basically, we want to, uh, we want to be able to offer up this sacrifice with clean hands and pure hearts. So we take a moment, and people, I believe, they love this this ritual at the beginning of mass because there is silence and, and everybody has come in from different places. It's a messy world. It's a very messy world. And even, even in the car on the way here, there could have been some altercation, you know, somebody got on your nerves. There's a, you know, you know there's a myriad of things that can happen that can disrupt our peace. And, and you know, we can be, especially like at this time too, where tensions are rising, uh, where people are kind of on the edge a lot of times, well, it wouldn't take much, actually, to say the wrong thing. And now, just imagine, uh, to come forward, you're agitated, you've maybe said something a little bit hurtful to a family member, or, and um, you want to get that out. And so you bring that to the Lord. We then have the uh, confidier, I confess, right? Or a another form of the penitential rite. Then there will be a form of an absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. That, that indeed is an absolution. If one is in the state of a very serious sin, grave sin, then he or she would be invited and obliged to approach the sacrament of reconciliation at his or her earliest possibility. But that absolution is it's rather, it's quite comprehensive. So when you hear those words, wow, okay, um, you can feel ever more at peace. Then we have the Gloria. That's that ancient hymn that glorifies God in all three persons. Then we'll have the opening prayer or called the Collect. And the Collect is uh, just that, it collects. So that's why when, when the priest says, he's not trying to find the page, although sometimes it looks as though he is, he will say, let us pray and pause. That's the invitation to have people bring any prayer from within their heart at that moment. And we will collect them all into this universal prayer of the church, okay? So there it is. Through Christ our Lord, amen. The priest is seated, maybe the deacon is here. The readings are proclaimed, often enough during ordinary time, uh, from the Old Testament, okay? So we see the um, centuries old workings of God, um, and his people, and we see the we see people wrestling very often with faith. We see the struggle, and uh, should take comfort in that. And you'll see the fidelity of God over an extended period of time. Next, we respond to that reading with a responsorial psalm. Okay, one of the 150 psalms that is generally linked to the first reading in, in its theme, and uh, which enables us to uh, participate and to, to pray that in a sung way usually, okay, and uh, to, uh, to respond. Now, uh, the second reading would then generally, well, would be from the New Testament, 
And we will see how the early Christian community was putting all of these truths in action and dealing with the various uh, opposing forces, the questions that had arisen, and just trying to exhort and uh, encourage the believing community. Because as you know, to, to be a follower of Christ is a marvelous thing, but it's, it's not easy but it's worth, worth all of the effort. So to see others who had, who had been um, struggling, for example, I can think of Saint Paul, hear, hearing St. Paul say, brothers and sisters, you must never grow weary of doing what is right. Well, do you not feel weary sometimes and say, you know what, I've had it. I've had it with, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, or I'm just tired now, I've done enough. No, brothers and sisters, you must never grow weary of doing what is right. Wow, how, how encouraging. And um, then the gospel, okay, with uh, the Lord Jesus in it, his teachings and his actions. Now, we then will have the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, okay, so we'll, we'll profess our faith. This has been happening since the very beginning of the church. And um, then we will have the prayers of the faithful, where we can't bring every prayer, but we certainly will bring highlight, highlights of maybe current events. You're beginning with the church, the world, uh, your particular parish, um, the ill and the dead, okay? And then, of course, any petitions you have within your heart, okay? Then the collection, of course, is typically taken at that time. Oh, oh the homily, of course, was after the gospel. And then uh, we come forward here, get, get, where the gifts have been brought forward, and then these, this ancient prayer, Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received this bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. And the people all respond, Blessed be God forever. Over the, uh, the chalice, we say something similar for the wine. Okay? Then the priest says a little prayer, asking the Lord to receive this sacrifice, which he offers with a humble and contrite heart. And then the washing of the hands. Now this is ritual, it wasn't always that way. It, uh, it actually had a very practical purpose in earlier times, and that really was to wash, get the priest's hands clean, because uh, you know, they weren't, uh, they weren't so conscious or even able to have the kind of level of sanitation that we do today. So, th that, but now it's a ritual. I don't wait, I don't say, oh, I think I'll skip the shower or washing my hands this morning because they're gonna be doing the lavable right. <laughs> no, it's not the way it is. This becomes a ritual asking that the Lord will remove, that I may be free from sin as I'm offering this sacred sacrifice, sacred offering, okay? Then, you know, the next prayer, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours, because it's a participation. It isn't a spectator. That's why I don't usually see this, but I have in the past sometimes, the person could be leaning against the pew, almost like they're in a living, a living room sofa or something. No, that's, um, that's a spectator's um, type of posture. This isn't a spectator's activity. This is participatory. My sacrifice and yours. How, how is it yours? Oh, because through baptism, you share in the threefold mission of Christ. Priest, prophet, king. You're part of the royal priesthood. Okay, so as am I, and then I have the ministerial priesthood, okay? So we have that prayer. Then um, prayer over the offerings, okay? Then a preface, and the preface will be linked to the, um, the particular season, okay? Um, and I'll, that changes, of course, from uh, typically from week to week, certainly from season to season. We have a number of prefaces that we can choose from depending on maybe what the readings were, what we'd like to emphasize, and to keep it also fresh so that we're not always saying the same thing. After that, people will then say or sing the Sanctus, holy, holy, holy. Well, this is coming to us, what, from the book of Revelation. The angels and saints are in the presence of Almighty God. Like, uh, they're praising him night and day. Can you imagine? Now, that might sound tiring to you at this point, but we have no idea about the majesty of God and how glorious and how um, overjoyed we will feel at every, there's no time in eternity, but at sort of every 
moment of that entire eternal experience. And so when you're that happy, you do give praise. Just think, hey, never, never another annoyance, never something where, you know, you're worried about your mood or how am I going to react to this? No, all of that will be completely a thing of the past. It'll be mere joy in the presence of God. And you, and you will, if you think, oh, I have pretty special needs, you know, will they be met in heaven? Well, exceeded, vastly exceeded. So, we have the holy, holy, holy. Then the people typically kneel. And then we have the Eucharistic prayer. Now, the Eucharistic prayer, this is where you'll note every Eucharistic prayer is prayed, it's addressed to whom? The Father, the Heavenly Father, always. And it's always through the Son, okay? In the, and, uh, and, uh, in the, in the unity, in the action of the Holy Spirit. So you will, uh, here we are, we're praying, just to give you an example, a very common Eucharistic prayer, the second one, which is the shortest one. That's why a lot of people like it. <laughs> so so we, this is where the consecration takes place at the very beginning of this one. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the, the dew fall. Now, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is what we call the epiclesis, the, the placing of the hands over top. We have asked the Holy Spirit to descend upon these elements of bread and wine to transform them into the Lord's body and blood. Now, in just, therefore, in just a moment, we will be having the words of institution, which the Lord Jesus had given right at the Last Supper. And uh, these are the exact words that he said. And by the duly ordained priest, who is in the, what we call, uh, the apostolic succession. Remember, I mentioned this before. We can't break from that. It means that the priest is ordained by the bishop, who at one point, uh, who was ordained by a bishop, by a bishop, by a bishop, who at one point uh, was uh, ordained by one of the uh, apostles. Isn't that amazing? That's the apostolic succession. It's lasted all this time, okay? So we say the words of institution, hold up the host, people adore and worship for a moment, then the priest genuflects, uh, usually a profound genuflection, because that is our Lord. Then the wine uh, mixed with a little bit of water, uh, the words of institution, and held up, and this has become the Lord's own blood. Okay, often place a pall over it, a pall, P-A-L-L, -L, which means cover, a pall, uh, just to, it's very, that's very practical. If there's a fly flying around or whatever, obviously there's sugar in the wine and the fly could go after that. Um, and um, that's typically, it. so it actually does have a very practical function. Okay, and then, okay, and then the memorial acclamation. So one of usually three, one of three memorial acclamations. And, uh, what we're doing is we're calling to mind uh, the mystery of, of our faith, okay? So, for example, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Or look at the words of St. Paul. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again, okay? Then we, we complete, we continue and ultimately complete the Eucharistic prayer. We have, uh, we've... Um, we're recalling the Lord's sacrifice, of course. We are speaking of our partaking in the body and blood of the Lord and how this will unite us by the Holy Spirit. We are lifting up the Holy Father and our bishop and all the clergy. We are remembering our brothers and sisters who have gone ahead of us marked with the sign of faith. And finally, we are we're, we're, um, offering honor to the Blessed Virgin Mary and the uh, saints, the, you know, the apostles and the glorious martyrs. Then, here is where the sacrifice of the Son to the Father should become more clear. So it's held up, okay, the host and the chalice, and then so through him and with him and in him, O, uh, o God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Now, heaven would be beaming beaming here because uh, people say, oh, well, I, don't, I, I don't understand and I don't have to be part of that or whatever. God loves me just as I am. I don't have to be part of any of this stuff. 
Well, he has prescribed it for us. And Jesus was very religious in the best sense of the term. Uh, Jesus, what did Jesus do on the night before he died? Had a Passover meal. What would you do on the night before you're going to be crucified or, or, or meet a horrible death? I know there are a number of people who'd say, well, I'd be out on the town, I'd be doing this and that. No, and Jesus was praying the Psalms while he was on the cross. Uh, very, very, um, and he was be constantly be visiting the temple, okay? Uh, the, so these, this is prescribed by the Lord, and uh, it's not a difficult thing to do. It's just that the times that we live in, uh, it's just, um, I guess, with individualism and with uh, comfort loving and with independent thinking and so on, uh, and scandals, that hasn't helped. Uh, oh, no, I don't need to be part of that. Well, it says in the letter to the Hebrews, this is first century Christianity, do not absent yourself from the assembly as some do. This was happening in the first century. Some people couldn't get out of their house, their rock house or whatever it was made of or saw it. I don't know what they were. It's hard to, maybe wood. Right, wood, wood, okay. And so then, the Lord said it, so that's good enough for me. And we've offered that up and feel that. Say, wow, Lord, I know how pleasing this is to you. Can you... Will you look upon me as you look upon your son? Will you? Like, uh, that, and that's the key. We, we're, our lives are hidden um, with Christ in God. Okay? Now, we have the Our Father prayer, the only prayer that Jesus ever taught. He said a lot of prayers, but he taught this one. And it has all of the components, you know, uh, worship and honor of God. Uh, uh, let me see, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Well, do you think that's happening here in, in large part in, in many people's lives? No, my will is being done here. Um, no, we're praying that God's will will be done here as it is in heaven. That's what makes it heaven. The fact that God's will is completely running everything. And, and those who are in there love it. They have no opposition to it. That's what makes it heaven. That's why some won't be there, because uh, they really don't like his will. And they've never been able to, no matter how much God has um, worked with them in this lifetime and all the graces that he has poured out, no, they've never quite been willing to allow that to take place. And so to be with him would be hell. And so they, they, they have an alternate place to be. Now, um, Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, this is the greeting of peace. And um, we ask that, uh, it, don't look on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Okay, now, often there has been the sign of peace. It was customary here in this part of the world to have a handshake, in other parts to do a little bow, this kind of a thing. Um, I believe that the handshake is going to be out indefinitely probably it will never return. It started in the 60s. That would be good news for some people. Started in the 60s, and uh, I think it has ended now for good. So, uh, plus this business of then having to grab hand sanitizer after touching somebody's hand, well, I know that can be offensive to some people too, because it makes it, I understand why, but you know, people, it's, just don't touch them then, if that's the case. So, but do extend the peace from the heart. Okay? And no more limp fish. Just, I bow in respect to you, my brother or sister in Christ. Yes. And I, I want to honor you, okay? As I honor the Lord. Now, we then have the fractioning rite. So we're going to break apart the host, place a little portion into the precious blood, okay? And uh, there's normally a little prayer that is said there. Uh, what is that? The... The prayer. Hang on for a moment. Um, well, I, I thought it was marked out in here actually, but um, it uh, maybe they didn't put it in the new missile. Okay, so don't worry about that. Um, oh, yeah, don't don't worry about that. Okay, but we do put. See, 
he takes the host, oh, sorry about it, it's right here, sorry, I mean, I look at it, yet, may this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. So we mingle the, the body and the blood of the Lord into the chalice here, okay, just a small particle. Now, of course, this host has been broken, and behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. You know what we say, right out of the scriptures, what the centurion had said to Jesus, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Okay? We reverently consume both species. Okay? And then the faithful are invited to come forward to receive. The priest is, there's the odd one, again, the silly things that have happened over the centuries sometimes, especially in the um, parts of the 20th century after the 1960s. Uh, the priest standing here saying, I'm not receiving ahead of the faithful, ahead of the people, so I'll receive after. Well, sorry, this harkens back to the sacrifices, the Jewish sacrifices, animal sacrifices, and the priest was consuming first. It's not that anybody's better than anyone else or a favoritism or anything. It's just uh, this is what we're doing, okay, that we, um, in observance of these ancient animal sacrifices, well, why? They would sacrifice a lamb. Well, this is the lamb of God, okay, God himself. So the priest reverently receives and then he distributes to the faithful. They then have a, a prayer in their hearts of thanksgiving. The priest will purify the vessels. Notice how, you know, people have said, well, why don't, um, we could all receive uh, the precious blood or the, some people call it the wine. It isn't wine any longer, remember. It's the, it has changed substantially. So they'll say, well, why don't you just have little cups over here and so on. And they do in some, in some Protestant churches. We wouldn't, we can't do that because of the residual that would be in each cup. And then you can't, you can't throw that out into the garbage. It's just like here. We don't just simply put, lay this chalice off to the side, oh, let's wash it in the sink now, and it has some of the Lord's precious blood. No, you purify it. So, water, okay, the, and the particles, any particles on the paten here? Okay, because that is the Lord. And consume, and then the vessel will be washed later on, okay? But it's all been, all the particles and the precious blood have been reverently consumed, okay? And that's also a sign for you when you receive. Please be very careful that uh, if you do receive, uh, receive on the hand, if you should happen to notice, like look at your hand again to ensure that there wasn't even a small particle that then you could um, consume, okay? Because that's, this is the Lord. So vessels are cleared. Let's see. The, then I would sit down for several moments, have a silent prayer of my own, and then let us pray. The prayer after communion. Okay. Finally, the, um, usually the St. Michael the Archangel prayer, which we've been adding, for the, from the, uh, the bishops have advised us to do that over the past year or year and a half, because of the evident increase of evil. That it's not just your imagination, it, uh, it, does, it, uh, it is on the rise in different ways. And the bishops are aware of this. And so we pray the St. Michael, the Archangel prayer, to ask for additional help from Michael, the great slayer of the uh, evil one. Then the Lord be with you. And then the final blessing, okay, and the dismissal. If the deacon's standing over here, go forth in peace, uh, glorifying the Lord by your life. So I want to thank you very much for your, again, your patience. And uh, hopefully, you know, some of the vessels have been learned. Did I say that this was a patent? I did. And chalice and Paul and purificator. And the background to some of this, okay? And the reason why you want to be present. So for those who are really hungering for the Eucharist, it's because the Lord is calling you in, okay? So may God bless you. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, it's good afternoon. Today we have for our coffee, we've got um, Lisa Fillingham, okay, and we've got Connie Tracy. Both are, I'm sure, quite well known to most in the parish. Now, um, they are both very active in the parish, but uh, 
Of special note is the fact that Connie is the current president of our Catholic Women's League um, Council here, Parish Council, and uh, Lisa is a past president. And uh, interestingly enough, Lisa is also in line to be the next diocesan president. Okay, and uh, so the and as you know, the Catholic Women's League is very very active here in the parish. Now um, let's see. Okay, so uh, ladies, what would uh, are you doing reasonably well today? I'm doing great, well. thank you. Yeah. yeah. And and what, Connie, we're uh, we're not seeing you. I don't think, uh, Connie. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, yeah, that's how Zoom is supposed to work. That when you speak, then you come on. Oh, it switches. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm doing just fine. Thank you. Oh, good. We were having a Zoom meeting with the bishop the other day for the first time in these three months. And um, it's, so what would happen is that there were uh, all, all of the city priests, basically, most of them were, were there. So all you had to do was cough, and then it immediately <laughs> shows, on to, shows up to you, eh? So, and uh, that's what happens. So, so and when that, my dog starts barking, you're gonna when keep my dog running. starts barking, it's going to look like me. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what's <laughs> That's good. Oh, that's great. Okay, yeah. Well, just make sure that when the dog is barking that your mouth isn't moving otherwise. Okay. And Lisa, Lisa loves dogs too. Don't you, Lisa? I'm sorry. Yes, I love dogs. Okay. okay. Now, and listen. Cats. Oh, and cats too. Now, Connie. No, no, that's yes. fine. I'm sure the dog is um, the mailman. I've got this question for you both right now. Um, are you, it's been uh, basically just about three months since we've enjoyed worship and our faith sharing and uh, of course our time in our beautiful church, right? Now, uh, among other things, there've been a number of other changes and, and um, challenges. So how have you both been, would you say, one at a time weathering all of this? I know that you, like Lisa is at home um, and you are retired, so you have been at home. Um, it's not like, so, so you didn't get uh, removed from your job or anything like that, but nevertheless, there are a number of changes. So go ahead and uh, let, let me know how you've been um, surviving through, through all of this first. Connie? We're doing just fine, thank you. We are so lucky because um, we're both retired, mm -hmm. um, so jobs, finance, not a problem. Um, anything that's happened in our household has just been compared to what others are going through has just been minor inconvenience. Okay. Um, we, we miss seeing our kids and our grandkids close up. Right. And like you alluded, you, like you said in the homily the other day, being able to, you know, to give them a hug or something is difficult, but compared to what so many people are going through, we are, we are extremely lucky. We're doing just fine. Thank oh, you. Oh, wow. And uh, well, that's wonderful to hear. Lisa, how are you making out overall? We're doing okay, thank you. Jeff's at work, and Laura is teaching from home. And um, I'm home, so exactly what Connie said, really, aside from missing my family immensely, everything is good for us as far as money and food and our home and not worrying about all that. So I think we're well ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yes, yes, I know. And 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 same here. There's just, uh, I, I put it this way, that I went from being a celibate priest to being um, a rather lonely bachelor, actually, for <laughs> uh, three months. And so that's been an, an adjustment. It doesn't, um, you know, but that, what, what are you going to do? And then, you know, we have a few lineups here and there. Um, the North, uh, the, the world seems to be falling apart at the moment. Um, hmm. But I guess when we're, <gasps> when we're down to nothing, God is up to something. Well, let's always remember that. Eh? And the Catholic Women's League continues to be a very strong force. I would say a force to be reckoned with. And we are uh, at nationally, we're, we're hovering at around, if I'm not mistaken, about 85,000 members, I believe. Is that not so? P pretty much. Uh, 8590. It's a uh, 80. Okay, 80. Okay. All right. This uh, and and then there's the they're transitioning, of course, and they've got their program over five year period. I think at five or five, where they're going to be, um, you know, reaching out us, meeting the need better the needs better of their members. And uh, and what would you say then about uh, uh, both of you about the Catholic Women's League? What what is the what is the mandate? I know there's a lot of 
is even amongst the priests, there's some misunderstandings sometimes because over, over the decades, the Catholic Women's League, of course, is 100 years old. And uh, over the decades, the ladies have been so active in the parish, often enough, doing things that were very practical. And so sometimes more than a few priests, for example, think of them as, as um, okay, it's coffee and cookies time, it's time to do this, get this done or whatever. And they're not necessarily thinking about the, the wholeness. Um, what, so what would you, how would you fill that in a little bit? And uh, what, what would you say the league it represents and what it's doing for, for, for people and the world? The country. Lisa? I thought it'd be you. <laughs> um, I believe the Catholic Women's League is far more than baking and knitting that sadly everybody associates us with. We are a force to be reckoned with. We are the only women's group in Canada that goes before Parliament. We make laws happen. We change the world and we fight for social justice. And that's what we should be recognized for. So it's an education curve. And as you said, there is a five-year marketing strategy in place. I'm on that committee. Um, there's seven of us across Canada. And you will see the changes. We have a hired a professional marketing group. And going forward, things are going to change. And what we do will become more prominent and truly people need to stop thinking of us as a little bunch of women who are looking for something to do because we are anything but thank you lisa <laughs> connie, connie any any additional thoughts on that matter and you've now been president of our parish council i believe it is it is it one year now i'm in my second year now okay okay yeah. um no lisa said it just right we we are just so much more than what people think we are. And um, this is why we need new members. We need new members desperately because our membership is falling, um, because we have to stand up for, for things that are right. And not just from a religious aspect, just from a societal uh, moral aspect. And this is, this is why I joined. Um, and this is how we, this is why we need to get other people, other women joining because um, there's just so much more that we can do very, with our numbers. Very, I, I hear very much so. And, um, and I know this, now when you say numbers dropping a little bit, not necessarily on, on this parish level, actually, no, no. no but um, uh, per perhaps provincially and nationally and the, the biggest province is Ontario with about I think it's about 40,000 uh, 40 or more thousand right of the women but uh, in addition to what you do for for society um, what about uh, the spiritual formation for the ladies themselves uh, and and also human formation Can you speak to that? I'm sorry about my dog <laughs> I mean you know what, what Connie uh, I, I just finished scrubbing down the deck yesterday and for many hours. Uh, there were spiders, uh, you know, all, everything that you can think of was on that deck. I've been fighting nature now for almost 53 years, and that dog, that's the dog of nature, so <laughs> I just, right. just let it go. So, I'm anyway, sorry. Sorry, She's go ahead. She's sleep all day. Um, no, you know, I have been so inspired by the women of our, the women in our parish, there are some women who are just so spiritually um, uplifting and they have taught me so much I have learned so much from them um, and this being a part of our parish CWL has done far more for me than I have given and, and, uh, oh, wow. and I, I it's all aspects spiritual um, everything just uh, right. yeah, it's well, brought me so much closer to that the, the church is other than my kids and my family that's the thing I'm missing most is my church community mm -hmm. because it feels like there is just this big hole oh. and that's because of the CW well largely because of the CWL okay oh very much now Lisa can you speak a little bit in terms of the human formation um, you are, you, I believe, are part of 
a, um, the, an educational initiative from the Catholic Women's League. Is that not so? Did you not, are you, uh, were you picked and are you sharing in some of that uh, online and et cetera? Um, I was chosen, I applied and I was chosen and it's not a Catholic Women's League Foundation. It's a Catholic Women's Leadership Foundation. Oh. And I think when people look at the acronym because it starts with CWL, they confuse the two. You do not have to be a Catholic Women's League member to apply or be on this course. Okay. So you apply, uh, 14 people are chosen across Canada. It is not, um, people go, oh, it's a, it's a CWL course and just kind of brush it off. It's anything but, it's through the University of St. Paul in Ottawa. It's a $10,000 course that is uh, picked up by donations and fundraising that they did before, prior to it starting. And what it does is it teaches you about transformational leadership. So it's not, um, I, an easiest way for me to explain it is, I've always had a role as a leader, but I was a very corporate leader because that's the way it was, you work, so you get people to buy into what's going on because that's your job. That also becomes your mentality, not realizing that. So now what I have learned through this course is how to be a better leader through the eyes of our Lord. So when you go to lead, what we think first is what would our Lord do? Uh, something. Spirit guide us. And then we'll excuse me. I think something, sorry, something may be wrong with the sound. I don't think it's, I hope it's just my computer. But I didn't hear that last statement. Can you try it again, please? Something, what would you? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, between there was a bark and then, and uh, it looked like you were barking and then the next thing, you know, <laughs> her bark is a lot worse than her bite though, everybody, you keep that in mind. So, but okay, you know. Okay, so what it, what it is, I think what you're, maybe the end part that we missed was mm -hmm. that um, I led from a corporate point and now I lead through Jesus. So when I go to lead, I think, what would oh, Jesus do? How would the Holy Spirit guide me so I can lead that way, as opposed to right away, this is how you do it, this is how you get the buy-in, let's move on. And you don't realize how embedded you are in a business world, regardless of where you are as a leader, it doesn't matter how, teacher, business person, um, whatever, you are working for your company and you're selling everything that way. Mm -hmm. This is through the way we should be selling it, especially to other mm -hmm. Catholic mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So it's open to everybody who is a Catholic woman. Okay. So Catholic teachers. Um, like Hamilton has a Catholic, uh, I can't remember exactly, Catholic, um, like facts. Okay. Family yeah. and children's services? Uh, yes. Yeah. So they have that. People who are doing those roles can apply, but you also would be retired and apply. There's no age limit. It's where you want the future to go in being Catholic and how you want to lead. Okay. Can, can, can I ask this very, um, you know, part of this leadership course, uh, and I know maybe you have told me this, but uh, when you mentioned it to me again yesterday, I was on the deck cleaning and I, I don't like to be disturbed actually. Okay. So I'm doing this. I'm, I'm thinking, plus I was running out of product and then, uh, and I had to, went, you know, Canadian tire, et cetera, then they didn't have any and so forth. Very frustrating. Um, but the question I want to ask you is, uh, is this, is the Laudato Si, that document that the, His Holiness put forward, I believe, two years ago? Or five. So? five. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Time, fly. Time flies. So this is part of that. You've said, oh, that's something unrelated. Well, can you speak a little bit, though, because I know we've talked about, I would like to, um, many people, some people have heard of that document. And um, you're, you're working to make it more known. You've, you've been studying it and you, you're interested in maybe offering some kind of um, teaching. And uh, but by the way, what is the encyclical about? Laudato Si is the encyclical that Pope Francis wrote. Um, Care for the common home is what you will see advertised most often. Okay. But it's basically to make the world more environmentally 
friendly. So it's to get rid of fossil fuels. It's to find ways to recycle. It's a better way to look at life. Um, the Pope is very, very concerned about climate control mm -hmm. and what needs to be done. So I signed up for the Laudato Si animators course, which is free. It's offered through the Vatican twice a year, obviously all online. No free trips to the Vatican, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> that would have been really good again. I don't nice think to I see it again. Go to Italy right now. <laughs> Not right now, no. Yeah. But um, uh, so I'm graduate next week from the course, and I'm going to put a proposal forward to our bishop, and then I'm hoping to get volunteers across the diocese to take the course in September. Okay. Um, I don't mind starting it. I don't have the time to run a group like this with the diocesan coming up. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what I would like to do is, uh, like I said, put the proposal forth to Bishop Burgi and see how we can move this into our diocese. Mm -hmm. Well, that certainly sounds like a worthwhile pursuit. And um, you, yeah, the care for the common home. And do, isn't that interesting? Because that, that does definitely dovetail with um, uh, development and peace. Is, this is the current co campaign, and that's what they're calling it, actually, a care for the mm -hmm. common home, uh, which we weren't, able to, we weren't able to really disseminate too many materials and so on, because I believe once we started, uh, then this COVID-19 took effect, and nobody's been in, eh? So. Right. Thank you, Lisa. That's going to be great. And Connie, could, could we return to Connie for a moment? Hello. Hello, Connie. Um, I noticed that Lisa is frozen. Yes. If Lisa's frozen, and that's appearing on your computer as well, Connie? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. No, but you're not. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so can I ask you, um, uh, do you have, what, any comments about... Uh, this, this ladder, this, um, you've heard of Laudato Si, of course, eh? Yes, the yes. Document. Okay. I keep meaning to, I keep meaning to look it up, the Latin to the English, uh, unless it does mean care for the, con well, Laudato Si, I, something like praise of something, that's what it tends to be, eh? Oh, I sorry. I failed grade 10 Latin, I don't know. <laughs> Your Latin's a little rusty, okay. Oh. You know what? <laughs> okay. So, Lisa, do you recall what, um, what it what it stand what it is in English? No. Usually and usually a pap a papal encyclical, what they'll they'll call it, the title will be uh, the first two or three words of the document, actually. So that's what they that they always tend to do, eh? Something like that. I think that's how it goes, unless I'm unless I'm getting that mixed up with um, dogmatic and pastoral constitutions. Uh, that can be at a council. But uh, anyway, sorry, I don't want to show too much ignorance here that people are going to lose confidence. Sorry, folks, but this is how lonely bachelors become. Okay, this is what happens. Okay, listen, well, we're uh, just about out of time now. Any final, any final comments? Uh, anything to encourage the faithful? Because this is, this is well watched, you know, the coffee talk. Oh, what would you just say, honey? Well, first of all, happy belated anniversary. Mm. We are so sorry that we have not yet been able to celebrate that with you. you. So that's one of the um, one of the things that we are postponing and looking forward to putting back into um, into motion. Um, there were quite a few other things that we had to postpone this fall as well, mm -hmm. or this spring rather as well, and um, we'll get to it. It's, it, it, we'll get to it. That's all I can say. It, it'll be fine. And you know what? I appreciate all of that, but I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm in no hurry because, uh, the, because we, you're, you're right. You, there was almost like a, um, a Freudian slip there where you, where you mentioned fall and you meant spring. Well, the fall is where a lot of these things are, are likely to get moved yeah. to. So yeah. the graduation from the high school, uh, the yeah. first Holy Communion, uh, uh, there could be extra masses, there will be all kinds of baptisms. Uh, it's just going to be really quite busy for many people. Yes. And, yeah. and people think, oh, well, Father, fine, go to that dinner. You, all you do, uh, you know, it'll be your day and wonderful. No, the problem is, is that when it's your dinner, you're on. And that all takes energy as much as I, you know. So I, I'm just so grateful that the Lord has brought me through through and to the 25th uh, anniversary. And uh, so he has, been, he has been faithful and good to me over, over this time. 
and uh, you know, went through a few hurdles. And uh, I guess there's probably going to be a few left. But um, anyway, um, Lisa. Yeah. Oh, is Lisa, did your computer die? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, but you're not actually coming on the screen anymore. Oh, I can see myself now. Oh, now, now you're back. Okay. So listen, any words of, any last minute words of, of um, encouragement to the faithful and to, you know, or anything about? Well, um, I think you give a lot of encouragement to the faithful. So I'm going to do the CWL plug. Okay. And um, I'm going to say, please take the time to join. Connie and I both joined as members who were non-participatory. In other words, we paid our dues and didn't go. And then slowly things evolved. And that's a choice we have made. Mm -hmm. You can always stay in that category if you choose. We would prefer you didn't, but you can do that. The importance is your membership because we need the numbers. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I don't want to hear I'm retired or when I worked, I fundraised, or when I worked, I did this. I worked, I fundraised, I had two kids, I was on board of directors, I was on committees. It's not the same thing. It is a different thing based on faith. And if you're a Catholic woman, and you can belong to the teachers union or the nurses union or whatever else, how can you not belong to the Catholic Women's League? Well, very well said. One of one of the one of the um, retired school teachers in Thunder Bay at Corpus Christi. That's what she said. She said, "Look, as teachers, we belong to the Federation, and she said, as Catholic women, we belong to the Catholic Women's League of Canada." And I said, "You know, well put, Liz. That was Liz." So listen, I want to thank both of you and and your camera. Everything's working well once again. I don't know what happened, but you know what, Ron Eckstein, who's um, putting all of this together is a mastermind actually i'll bet you he can correct the whole thing you watch and see <laughs> well, we hope because i hope i'm not frozen with some funny face you stuff. watch and see no ron ron Eckstein at Eckstein multimedia he does it all okay so mm -hmm. listen god bless you both and uh, we'll talk to you soon um as soon as we stop then the recording's going to stop but don't leave yet okay thanks father thanks for having thank us you. thank you